Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome in. Before we get started, I do see a prayer request in the chat, so I do want to address that prayer request. So let's come together in prayer for Miss Carolyn. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up Carolyn to you this morning. Father, we ask that your hand of healing, that your hand of mercy, that your hand of grace be upon her. Father, do something in that hospital room that leaves the doctors and the nurses in amazement. Father, if there's doctors and nurses that are coming in there that are not believers, that they are transformed by Carolyn's faith. Father, just allow everyone that comes in contact with her to come to the realization of who you are. But Father, we ask for a physical healing. We ask for a spiritual healing. We ask for a healing from the inside to the out. We ask for her to be made whole whole once again we ask this in jesus's holy name amen amen and amen so welcome in if you guys are new here we've been studying the book of ezekiel and we're all the way up to ezekiel 16 um so we're going to continue in ezekiel 16 today and we're going to be doing verses 1 through 12 and if you're new here, what I do is I read and then we begin to break it down verse by verse and we start to understand exactly what's taking place. Amen. So I hope you guys got your Bibles this morning. I hope we got paper, pen, something to drink. Um, that way we can dive right into this word of God this morning. So Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 1, Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 1, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. Cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your birth and your nat nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now, our holy God depicted the nation of Israel in chapter 15 as a useless vine. 
Now in chapter 16, God's going to remind the Jews of their former despised status among the Canaanite nations. And he's going to describe Jerusalem representing all the people of Israel as an unwanted child. He will use the imagery of a young baby girl orphan from childhood to maturity. In fact, not only is this little baby girl an orphan, the magnificent creator God points out that he rescues her from just being thrown away. Out of all the people in the world, the Holy One had pity on Israel and selected them out of his own mercy and his own grace and bestowed blessings beyond what anyone could imagine. In effect, he selected them as his own, as a man would select a bride as his own. How did this bride respond to this great love? And what we're going to start to see is what Ezekiel is getting from the Lord, and he's going to proclaim the word of the Lord this morning, and he's, you're going to see a whole new side of what Ezekiel is showing from uh, chapter 15. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I loved the musical The Phantom of the Opera. Uh, has anybody in here seen The Phantom of the Opera? Because sometimes I like to go and just watch some musicals or some operas and just take in all the scenes because I think the, the workings of it are pretty awesome, right? And the words of one of my favorite songs reveal the answer here. And the words of that song was, He was bound to love you when he heard you sing, and now how you repaid me, denied me, and betrayed me. That hurts, right? But that describes exactly what Israel did. God loved Israel so much, but yet they defiled him, they abandoned him, they forsaked him, they turned their back against them, and, 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 and they had walked away from God even though he loved them so much. And hearing that song really breaks the strings of my heart in how the nation of Israel, and more importantly me, have done the same to this holy, special, loving God. You see, God teaches us how his bride prostituted herself by seeking relationships with pagan nations and ultimately forsaking him for their phony gods. As we study his word, I want us to examine ourselves to see if we likewise have done or are doing the same awful things to him that Israel was doing. Are we placing anything in our lives such as family, education, careers, or pleasures as our first love instead of him? Chapter 16, Ezekiel 16. Are we placing anything in our lives such as family, education, careers, or pleasures as our first love instead of him? Because if we are, we are as guilty as the people he describes here. Now, Jesus says this to us directly in the gospel of Matthew chapter 10. And it comes out of verses 37 through 39. And it says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Amen. Look at Ezekiel 16, verses 1 through 3. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are for, from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Have you ever wished that you also could hear from God the way that Ezekiel did? Does anybody in here wish they could hear from God the way that Ezekiel did? What was it like? I mean, there's so many questions that we could ask. What would it, was it like to hear from God that the way Ezekiel was hearing from him? Now, we know from our past studies that he had a unique vision of the holy God. He then heard from him directly, and he knew his voice every time he spoke directly to him. 
How can we get to experience this same awesome and wonderful interaction with God we claim as our own? How is it that we can come to the same relationship with God that Ezekiel had? This might sound as an old lame answer, but I strongly cling to the belief in prayer and thorough study of his word. I believe through prayer and, 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 and thorough study of his word, we can have the same relationship with God that Ezekiel had. Look at James chapter 4, verse 8. We say, Pastor, I don't know because those were the Old Testament days. And, 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 and you're probably right. It was the Old Testament days. But see, there's something special about the days that we're living in that the Old Testament didn't have. See, the Old Testament had an overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament, the Spirit would come and the Spirit would go. The Spirit would come upon them and the Spirit would depart them. But in this day and age, from the time of Pentecost, we now have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now resides in us as the holy tabernacle of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit now resides in us as the holy tabernacle of God. So we have something that is different than the Old Testament. We have the Holy Spirit that resides with us 24-7, 365 days a year, and he wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. But there's a problem with our relationship with God. There's a problem with our relationship with God. Look what James 4, 8 says. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, there's a requirement on our behalf here. There's a requirement on our behalf. God's not just going to come to you, but you have to draw to him in order for him to draw near to you. Are you seeking God with all your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul? Are you seeking God with every being of your nature? Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 say it this way. Ask and it will be given to you. Okay, so I want you guys, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. First thing you got to do is you got to ask. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Amen. Ask and it will be given to you. But then it says something else. It says, seek. So now we got to ask and we got to seek. It says, seek and you will find. So we see two instructions already. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Then it says, knock, and it will be open to you. So we see three distinct instructions on how to get closer to God. Come on, you've got to see this this morning. You're given three instructions on how to get closer to God. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. It says, seek, and you will find. And then it says, knock, and it will be open to you. Well, pastor, how do you know that that's a way to get closer to God? How do you know that that's an instruction in order to get to God? Well, continue reading in verse 8, and it says this. Watch this. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. See, there's three direct instructions here on how to have the same relationship with God that Ezekiel had in his days. Come on, you guys got to see this. Psalm chapter 37, verse 4 and 5 says this. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Again, there's something you have to do here. You have to delight yourself. You have to be overjoyed. You have to be pressing in. 
And it says, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You got to delight yourself. You got to commit yourself. You got to trust you. You got to trust in him. So you got to delight yourself. You got to be delightful in the presence of God. You got to commit yourself to the Lord. And you got to trust in him. Doesn't sound too hard, does it? It doesn't sound too hard, but yet people struggle every single day. People struggle every single day doing just these simple three instructions. You see, God lays it out for us in print. God gave it to us so that we could see it, not just hear it, but we could see it. You want something? You want something, then this is how you go about getting it. You want more of God in your life, then he spells out the right path for you to take. You want a closer relationship, he gives you the instructions to get it. Are you looking for a miracle or a blessing in your life? He shows you how to receive it. Everything is written for you to find. Come on, give him praise this morning. If we look at the statement in verses 1 through 3, it says to know her abominations is God's direct lesson by experience. We have eyes to see but do not see. What kind, what mankind thinks he is doing okay? But see, what counts is what God thinks about our thoughts and our actions. It's not what the world is saying. It's not what you're saying. It's not what those around you are saying. It's what God is saying because all that should matter is what God thinks about our thoughts and our actions. And what God's going to do here in Ezekiel 16 is he's going to teach them through a story their real character. He's going to give them a visual so that they can understand exactly where they lie because they haven't understood anything up to this point. The term abominations carries with it something that makes one physically ill. So what, what, what's happening is we start out right away with a nauseating report. We're starting out with a nauseating report. And I want you to catch what our Lord has said in verse 3. He says, do you see something here that's a little different? He says, he says the to us this, your birth and your nativity. Your birth and your nativity. Are they not the same thing? Is your birth and your nativity the same thing? No, they're not. There's a more deep gold nugget here being brought out by our amazing God in, in, in a few words. The word nativity means more than birth. The word nativity means more than birth. It, it, it references the place, the time, and the accompanying conditions. It references the place, the time, and accompanying conditions. In Luke chapter 2, we derive all the information of our Lord Jesus' nativity. Amen? You can go to Luke chapter 2 and read all of Luke chapter 2, and you're going to see the nativity scene. That's why it's called a nativity scene. Because it's a scene because it's placing you in the time, the place, and the accompanying conditions. But see, our Lord has really been hurt by betrayal of his love. He said, the Amorite was your father and your mother was a Hittite. Take that. He says, look, your, 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 your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite. And our Lord, whose heart is broken, says that which is exactly that which the ins insult was intended to be. The Israelites then and even today pride themselves 
On what, guys? What do the Israelites pride themselves on? The number one thing they pride themselves on is their ancestry. The Canaanites had become festered with immorality and sin. The Jews knew that that was the reason for our Lord ordering their total destruction. Our Lord pointed out to the Jews that they were not, in fact, racially pure as they espoused themselves to be. He is showing the flaws in them. Come on. You've got to catch this this morning because he's showing the Israelites the flaws within their lineage or their ancestral line. To a large degree, like America, they were a melting pot of other nations. And I'm going to show you this. Abraham came from Iraq, modern-day Iraq. There was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. In addition, the Jews failed to obey God and utterly eliminate the pagan people of the land when God allowed them to enter the promised land. Therefore, the Hittites and the Amorites continued to dwell in the land and wound up intermarrying with Israelites. In fact, here's a good question for you to think about. What good friend of David did he have unalived? Come on, you've got to know these facts. What good friend of David did he have unalived? Nobody? Uriah. He had Uriah unalived. And Uriah was a high he type. And we read that Uriah is listed as one of David's valiant friends in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty men. And Uriah, the Hittite, there were 37 in all. You see, God was to be the Israelites' God alone. He was everything to them. He treated them as a perfect father would. And we read here that the Lord is telling the Israelites that their parents who raised them and taught them was not their true father. But their parents were these pagan parents. The kids, the Jews, behaved as they watched these false parents. You see, a true statement is this. Much more is caught than taught. Let me say that again. Much more is caught than taught. Look at verses 4 through 5. Look through verses 4 through 5. As for your nativity on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. I know that you're aware of why we study the scriptures, correct? I know you guys are aware of why we study the scriptures. We don't come together to get smarter, but our need is to get wiser. Amen? We don't come to get smarter. We come to get wiser. And we don't get wiser in our own knowledge. We get wiser in God's knowledge. We receive God's knowledge, God's wisdom. Amen? What lessons we find out from the lives of the Jewish people of Bible times are for our learning. It's for our learning. It's not to, it's not for us, right? Or it's not to us, but it's for us. So if we're looking at Old Testament, this is learning material so that we don't make those mistakes again. We need to understand the things that the nation of Israel did wrong and were punished for, hopefully that we do not repeat them. 
The first rule of study is to pray. And you pray that God would help you understand what you're reading. Then you need to look at them on a personal level to see if they apply in your life. So the first rule of studying the word of God is to pray before you start. Lord, I ask that you show me what it is I need to see. Give me your wisdom and your knowledge that I can understand the fullness of your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Or whatever you're going to pray. But you need to pray for God to speak and you to be quiet. Let me say that one more time. You need to pray for God to speak and you to be quiet. God has given us a story here in chapter 16 that deals with the current abominable positions the nation of Israel was at. And we can also derive a vivid description of our own lives. God reminds the occupants of the city of Jerusalem, it's national pastime. He reminds them that in reality, they were nothing when he first found them. The picture image he uses is that of an abandoned newborn little girl. And as mentioned earlier, the nativity refers to the nation of Israel being born in what immediately followed. The mentioning of your mother was an Amorite and your father a Hittite helps us to recognize that this time frame is when the nation of Israel, come on, the nation of Israel came out of Egypt heading towards the land of Canaan. As slaves, the Jews were treated horribly. They were unwanted. Now look at how bad this is. Look at how bad this is. I want you to look at this. You guys got to understand this this morning. On the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out in the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. Does this shock you? I mean, reading this, some of th- this may be the first time any somebody in here has ever read this. Does this shock you? Here's a baby that was never even separated from the mother's uterus. The little baby is thrown out in the field, still alive. Connected still to the afterbirth. The bloody stains from the birth were not washed. No antiseptics were used. That's why it says salt, because salt was an antiseptic at that time. The child was just cast away as garbage. I'm going to paint a grim picture for you. So here's a warning to anybody that doesn't want a grim picture painted to cover your ears. Because this goes on today in the millions. This goes on today in the millions of what medically would be called late term Abortion. This is exactly what was taking place in Ezekiel's day. Our parents give us life. And we thank them for that. Yet this description of a helpless newborn is a perfect spiritual picture of every one of us. First of all, the infant was unwashed. So what we can say here is that the child was unclean. Remember, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says this. It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our inequities like the wind have taken us away. 
Sin is not something that God takes lightly. He informs us in Isaiah chapter 59 this, but your inequities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, our sins create a huge gap between God and us. If not corrected, the situation would result in us having the same condition throughout this life and the eternal life to come. We all deserve hell. You've got to wake up and recognize that today. That I don't care if you're a born-again believer. A born-again believer still deserves hell, but because of God's grace and his mercy, we won't experience it. It was nothing you did. It was nothing you worked for. It was nothing that you earned. It was because God's grace and his mercy allowed you not to experience the wrath of hell. Come on. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 informs us that in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We see that there will not only be the problems here in life, but also eternal suffering. We see from this passage in Ezekiel that we are also unsanitary. In other words, we stink. I don't care how many showers you take. You stink because your righteousness is as a bag of filthy rags. You guys understand what filthy rags is, right? No cologne or perfume will ever cover up your stench. What happened during the time of the prophet Amos also applies to our conditions. Amos chapter 4 verse 10 says this. He says, I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. In the book of Psalms, chapter 38, we see a true picture of a man who has come to identify his exact state of existence. It says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For your arrows pierce me deeply and your hand presses me down. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my inequities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. He goes on and he says, for I am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my inequity. I will be in anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and they are strong. And those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries. Because I, oh come on, I follow what is good. I follow what is good. You have a choice to make. You have a choice to make here. You can either follow what is good or you can follow what is of the world. He says, I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. You have a choice to be made. You can choose to follow the righteousness of God or you can choose to follow the world. Like the child described in Ezekiel 16, we were also unclaimed. Oh, somebody better shout this morning. Like the child described in Ezekiel, we were also unclaimed. No one wanted this baby. The mother just threw this baby away as trash. And Satan has convinced the world again that human life is not important. 
One of the biggest insults man can, mankind has made against God is not denying the fact that he is the wonderful creator, God. But the man gives credit to nothingness. They believe everything just happened by chance. They believe everything happened just by chance. They believe in evolution, and evolution has been developed and promoted by Satan. Oh, I'm dropping couches and kicking shins this morning. I believe that he thinks that he just came into existence and was not created. I believe he thinks the same thing happened to God. He just happened to evolve before Satan. So Satan thought that he had a right to the top position, which belongs to the only true and lasting sovereign ruler, our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mankind, which likes the appeal to the senses, sensationalism, can easily adopt into the fallacy of evolution. That we just evolved from monkeys, right? That we just evolved from monkeys. There's a poem I like, and it's written by an unknown author, and it's titled Three Monkeys in the Coconut Tree. And I'm going to share that with you this morning. It says, three monkeys sat in a coconut tree, discussing things as they are said to be, Said one to the others, now listen you two, there's a rumor around that can't be true. The man descended from our noble race, the very idea is a great disgrace. No monkey has ever deserted his wife, starved her babies, and ruined her life. And you've never known a mother monk to leave her babies with others to bunk, or pass from one on to another, till they scarcely knew who is their mother. Here's another thing a monkey won't do. Go out at night and get in a stew. Or use a gun or club or knife to take some other monkey's life. Yes, man descended the Henri Cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. See, we realize that this child's situation in life was uncontrollable. The baby girl had no way to change its situation. It would just die or be unalived and eaten by a wild animal. How about you? How about you this morning? Do you think that you can correct your life all by yourself? Do you think that your choices will fix the circumstances in your life? Do you think that you have full reign to do whatever you want? If you could make this life really great and satisfying, is this all that is left to your existence? Or maybe just by chance, just by chance, is there a future life? Is there a heaven? And if there is, If there is an afterlife and there is a heaven and there's a living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how are you going to get there? How are you going to get there? There's correct answers to these questions. There's correct answers to these questions, but you're probably not going to like them. And you probably don't want to hear them. Like this baby girl, we also are totally helpless to save ourselves. But we like the story in Ezekiel and someone real who has watched us struggle. He didn't have to, but he had compassion and he rescued us. We need to stop playing games and recognize. We need to stop playing games and recognize who has been the true rescuer of our souls and give him the thanks and the appreciation and the love that he really deserves. Come on, just take a moment and give him the praise. Give him the glory. Give him the honor because you didn't do it. It was all because of his grace and his mercy. Hallelujah this morning.
Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, and when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. God describes that he found that baby girl in her dreadful condition. Just picture this. Picture this this morning. The infant kicking and struggling in her own blood to live. Did you know Jesus described himself similarly when he said this and indicated in the gospel of Luke? He said, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit in eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. But he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the same place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he sat him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him? Who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You see, our God has saved the child and us from the wallowing in our own blood. He is the one who has had compassion when no one else would or could. Look at this verse in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. It says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, God gave his command twice here. He said to live. He only spoke once to Lazarus to come out of the grave. How much more is his heart stirred to command not just once, but twice? His command is the same for us. These scriptures take on more meaning than you could probably grasp without coming into the knowledge of who God is. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him, believes is an ongoing thing. It's not a once and done. You have to continue in this walk. You have to continue in your faith. You have to continue in your belief. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 6, verse 47 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. If God has come to you and you responded to him in faith, then he causes you to live because he gave his blood for you. There was a transfusion. There was a blood transfusion from him to you, and you received everlasting life. Come on, praise his name this morning. There was a transfusion. Just as we see in Ezekiel 16. <clears throat> Starting in verse 7, watch this. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. You see, God could have used any example. God could have used any example to explain his blessings upon the Jews. Did you catch what he used, though? Did you catch what he used? 
He could have used anything, but he used the example of flowers. He planted them in the land that he selected. They grew into a plant, into a nation. If you guys are taking notes, you might want to start writing. That was beautiful to behold. He planted them as flowers. So he planted them in the land that he selected. And they grew into a plant or a nation. And that was beautiful to behold. People would come from all over the world just to see this people who had a God that was alive and very active in human interaction. God also selected a special city. He selected Jerusalem. He looked upon it as a young woman that had matured, right? He said, your breasts were formed. So it was a young woman that had matured and that it was beautiful. Yet, Without his presence, the city was nothing. It said they were naked and bare. Are you guys starting to see how God made this correlation? It was just like any other city. The idea of nakedness not only suggests need, but also purity. In Genesis chapter 2, we find the first mention of nakedness. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, you see the first mention of nakedness where it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. As we see from this passage, before sin entered the picture, the couple were pure and had nothing to be ashamed about. Such was the view that our Holy Father had of his people, the Jews, at first. Look at 8. Come on, you guys got to see this. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. You see, as God observed the maturity of his elect people, he desired a deeper relationship. Just as a young woman comes into maturity and is ready for marriage, God compared his people with this example of deep love. This act began after he freed them from the bondage in Egypt. He led them to Mount Sinai as described for us in the book of Exodus chapter 19. Where it says, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Raphadim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain, and Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him to call to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and to the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priest and a holy nation these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel the NIV version of the Bible displays verse 8 is this later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Notice that instead of wings, as the King James interprets, we see the husband-wife relationship explained as the spreading of man's garment over the woman. Did you know there's a similar example of this in the book of Ruth, chapter 3? Go with me to Ruth chapter 3. And we're going to read 1 through 9. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? 
Now, Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet and laid down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself. And there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. We see the interactive role of wing to the spreading of the garment over the woman, signifying the man's role of taking the woman under his protection as a marriage covenant. Come on, are you seeing this? There is a covenant here of marriage between God and his chosen people. Well, pastor, the church is the bride. It has never been the church. It will never be the church. The bride of Christ is Israel. The house of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. That is his chosen people. Forget what you've been told. Forget what you've been taught and allow the word of God to show you the truth. Look at 9 through 12. It says, then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood. And I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I'll put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. God is love. He is the one who created love, and he definitely knows how to lavish it out in his own way. God has taken the ones he loves and has washed away all their impurities. He has taken our sins and cast them away as far as the east is from the west and has promised to remember them no more. I want you to stop and meditate on something this morning. I want you to stop and meditate on something this morning. He has cleansed every stain of our past, our present, and our future lives. I want you to think about that. He has cleansed every stain of our past, our present, and our future lives. Forever. The prophet Isaiah has this to say. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are like red, like crimson, red, like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, and then you come into Paul's writings and in first Corinthians chapter six, it speaks about two of the three wonderful conditions God does for us after we're saved. Look at first Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse 11, first Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse 11, it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. You see, when you are justified by God, you are free from the penalty of sin. As the song of worship goes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? I'm not a singer. You, got, you get the idea. 
Nothing can wash the sin but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can make you whole but the blood of Jesus. As his child living on this earth, he then sanctifies us. We are freed from the power of sin. Yes, we still bear about the old man, but our precious God has given us his great Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit now lives in us. He resides with us. The last action not mentioned in verse 11 is glorification. God will remove from us the presence of sin. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. He says, I anointed you with oil. That is from olives. And it has a great amount of uses in biblical times. Then and still today, you can cook your food with olive oil. It was also used as a medicine. If we follow along with the Lord's description of rescuing this unwanted child, he applied oil to the wounds of this baby after washing her. In this act, you can see him care for all the emotional, all the physical, and all the spiritual needs. As a loving father, he cured all the ailments that afflicted her. You see, but oil was also set apart as something special. It, it pictured the anointing of a person by the Holy Spirit. Its first use in this important dedication is listed in Exodus chapter 40. And if you look at Exodus chapter 40, if you start in verse 11, it says, And you shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as a priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father that they may be ministered to me as priest. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did according to all the Lord has commanded him, so he did. You see, kings were also set apart and consecrated to God with oil. The prophet Samuel was sent by God to the family of Jesse to anoint a new king of Israel. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, we pick up a new story here. It says, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking, and the Lord said, arise. Anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. You say, well, Pastor, this is Old Testament. Pastor, what does this Old Testament have to do with what we're facing right now? What does this Old Testament have to do with who we are? What does this Old Testament have to do with us as Christians? <laughs> Did you know that we've been blessed with the same anointing of the Holy Spirit that only a few people in the past were allowed to experience? Oh, you better shout this morning. You have something so special that only a few people in the Old Testament ever received it. When, when the Lord Jesus Christ became our Lord and Savior, he put his Holy Spirit in us. Look at some of this great information. Romans 8 verse 9. Look at Romans 8, verse 9. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Look at 1 Corinthians 
chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. You know, if we just take some time daily and just reflecting on those three verses, how much more will we get our priorities right? If you just took time and focused on those three verses, you'll see how your priorities start to get straightened up. Because we'll again recognize that we are not the masters of our own ships. That we were bought with an expensive price, and that is by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verses 10 through 12 once again of Ezekiel 16. He says, I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. I'm going to let you in on a little secret this morning. And you might not like it, but it doesn't matter. You cannot outlove the Lord. You cannot outlove the Lord. This child in this scripture passage represents the nation of Israel. She was given life by God and now matured into a beautiful woman. The listed here are gifts from a man to his bride. The loving God himself gave this same type of expensive material goods to Israel. We see in the books of 1 Kings chapter 10 that the Holy Yahweh made this tiny country the most influential in the world. He says in verse 23 of chapter 10, So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. You see, we have eyes to see, but do not see what God sees. Our Lord God sees us clothed in the righteousness of our master and king, Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says this. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 9 says this, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. God cannot wait to pour out his blessings upon you if you'll only let him. If you've never committed your life to him, or if you want to come back to him, look at what he says. He says about you, as written down in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting in verse 11. He says, and then he said, a certain man had two sons. Oh, come on. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his, to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough 
and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose, came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Remember, this all started off with no one caring whether this child lived or died. Then the Lord Lord stepped in and look what happened. She was the envy of the whole world. Everyone wanted what she had been given. Does that apply to you and me today? Do people want what you have? Have you stored away all the precious gifts that he's given you? Or have you tarnished his jewels? Give it all back to him now and he will clean up everything. Are you ready to trust in the Lord? Are you ready to give him what he deserves? Are you ready to be an obedient servant of God? Are you ready to be an obedient servant of God?